Well, dear friends, on this Lord's Day, I invite you to turn with me, please, to our scripture reading as it is found in the book of Acts, the first chapter. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts in the New Testament, Acts chapter 1. And if you are using a maroon Bible, this can be found on page 935, page 935 in our maroon Bibles. The second book penned under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit by Dr. Luke, the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1. It's interesting to note, as many scholars have pointed out, that verse 8 of Acts 1 really sets forth the theme of the entire book of Acts. When Jesus says to his disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses, my martyrs, that's where we get our word martyr from, uh, my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You can read through Acts and see the gospel going forth in Jerusalem and then Judea and Samaria and then ultimately all the way to Rome. So that, that sort of is the, the theme text of the book of Acts. But we're going to be reading uh, verses 1 through 11 of Acts chapter 1. And as I hinted at previously, and as you can see in the subscription in the NIV, this is about Jesus being taken up to heaven. It is about his ascension. Boys and girls, again, 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus ascended on high. And then it was 10 days, boys and girls, after his ascension that he poured out his Holy Spirit. And that's the day of Pentecost. You see the 50 in, in Penta, 50 days after his resurrection, 10 days after his ascension, we have the day of Pentecost. And Lord willing, that's what we will be celebrating and commemorating next Lord's Day, the day of Pentecost. But for today, I draw your attention to uh, God's Word, Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 1 and reading through verse 11. Let us hear then the Word of the Lord. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day He was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised which you have heard me speak about. John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen Him go into heaven. Thus far the reading of God's holy word. And as always, dear friends, I ask and urge you to keep your Bibles open and handy as we look to God's word together on this Lord's Day. Dear congregation of Jesus Christ, question. Do you ever read or have you ever read storybooks to your children? Do you ever read or have you ever read storybooks to your children? And I see the heads nodding and I've heard, I've heard some yes. Okay, I, I, I'm glad to hear that. I, I suspected that would be the case. Another question, and this is part personal confession. Have you ever done what I used to do when I would read storybooks to our children at times and skip a few pages Oh, God bless you all. <laughs> I didn't know how you would answer that. Um, to get to the end of the book a little more quickly. And I'm glad that I am not alone in that. 
Now, if the children are familiar with the book, they might say, hey, mommy, hey, daddy, you skipped some pages. And you say, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, honey, you're right, and, and you go back. But if they're not real familiar with the book, or if their eyelids are beginning to droop and they're starting to nod off, you can generally get away with it. And when you get to the end of the book, even when you've done that, they may very well say, as our children used to say, thanks, daddy, that was a really good story. You, I admit you feel a little guilty at that point, but that's what you do. That's what you do at times. Sometimes you're under time pressure. Now, friends, as I was contemplating that this week, it occurred to me that that same thing may also occur not only concerning our physical children, but concerning God's spiritual children, people like you and me. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean, dear friends, is that you and I may, may sort of skim through the Bible at times, and we may sort of hit some of the highlights, creation, fall, Noah's flood, etc., and go through the New Testament the same way, and get to the end of this book and say, in effect, as it were, thanks, Daddy, Abba, that was a really good story not realizing that we may have missed some of the critical moments in redemptive history. And I respectfully, humbly propose to you today that one of those moments that we may often neglect or forget or skip over is the ascension of our blessed Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, friends, as we begin to work our way through Acts chapter 1 together on this Lord's Day, we find ourselves being challenged by the fact that just as was true for these disciples, these 11 disciples some 2,000 years ago, so too if you and I also desire to be able to faithfully fulfill our own calling and our own commission for the cause, kingdom, and church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, then by the grace and mercy of God through faith in the name of Jesus, you and I must learn the same three critical lessons that the disciples had to learn on that day concerning the ascension of our Savior, concerning the ascension of our Savior. Now, what exactly are those lessons? Well, as we begin to work our way through the words of our text, we find that lesson number one was a critical reason for the ascension. They had to learn, and we have to learn, a critical reason for the ascension. Now, for example, if you will silently skim over our scripture reading for today, those first 11 verses of Acts 1, just sort of silently skim it over in your mind's eye, did you happen to catch the fact that there is one name that is mentioned just in those 11 verses no less than three times? There's one name that is mentioned no less than three times just in those 11 verses. It is not the name Theophilus, which is mentioned in verse 1. Uh, it is not even the name uh, Jesus, which is mentioned also in verse 1. The name that is mentioned, some of you are saying, the name that is mentioned no less than three times is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Look with me, if you would, please, in verses 1 and 2. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day He was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles He had chosen. And now we drop down to verse 5. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with, notice, the Holy Spirit. And then again in verse 8. But you will receive power, dunamis, when, we, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Why is that so significant that under the inspiration of the Spirit, Luke mentions the Holy Spirit no less than three times? Well, one of the reasons, I believe, is because Jesus himself had prophesied that unless he went away, the Holy Spirit would not come to them. Unless he went away, he would not send the Holy Spirit to them, and the sending of the Holy Spirit would be for our good, and it would be for God's glory. And so, for example, if you would care to turn with me, let's go back to John chapter 14, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John chapter 14. If you want to just listen to our cross-references, that's fine, but otherwise, turn with me, please, to John 14, verses 15 through 19. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John 14, beginning in verse 15. Jesus is speaking. And he says to his disciples, If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore but you will see me because I live, you also will live. If you're in John with me, turn over to John 15, please. 
verses 26 and 27. John 15, 26 and 27. Jesus is still speaking. And he says, When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. And then finally on this score, drop down to chapter 16, verses 5 through 11. Verse 5 of chapter 16, Jesus continues, But now I am going to him who sent me. None of you ask me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief, because I have said these things. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Now, friends, needless to say, what we have here is a prophecy of Jesus concerning the sending of His Spirit that was in fact fulfilled 10 days after the ascension on the day of Pentecost. And that is why, if you would care to turn with me again just for a moment uh, to uh, Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 18. We're not going to read it again, so if you don't want to turn, that's fine. But I'm going to use it as a commentary. Turn with me, please, if you would care to, to page 880, page 880, Lord's Day 18, question and answer 49. The question asks, how does Christ's ascension to heaven benefit us? The theme of the Heidelberg Catechism is our only comfort. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And here that theme of comfort comes through once again. How does Christ's ascension to heaven benefit us? And drop down in that answer where it says, Third, He sends His Spirit to us on earth as a corresponding pledge or a further guarantee. By the Spirit's power, we seek not earthly things, but the things above where Christ is, sitting at God's right hand. And friends, that that refers to Christ's session, His being seated at the right hand of the Father. It is the position of all power and glory and authority as He rules over all nations, He rules over all kingdoms, He rules over, indeed, all creation. And that is the first lesson that the disciples had to learn and the lesson you and I have to learn as well. And that concerns the sending of the Holy Spirit that being a critical reason for the ascension of our Savior. Well, you may want to keep that Lord's Day handy. We'll be referring to it again. But at this time, let's go back to our text in Acts chapter 1, where we find a second key lesson which the disciples had to learn, and you and I have to learn, concerning the ascension of our Savior. And that lesson is the comforting reality of the ascension, the comforting reality of the ascension. Let's pick it up in verse 6 of Acts 1. Look with me, please. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. And by the way, throughout church history, uh, many uh, heretics have tried to predict the day and the time and the year when Christ is going to return. Jesus said, it is not for us to know the time or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But, contrast, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He said, you will be. And who were they? Well, they were fishermen. Luke was a doctor. Matthew was a tax collector. Think of all of the different uh, occupations that are represented here in worship today. And Jesus is saying that to you and me. We are to be His witnesses beginning near home in Jerusalem and then throughout the broader area and through missions and so on uh, to the ends of the earth. Verse 9, look with me, please. After he said this, in other words, his teaching, his earthly instruction of them had now come to a completion. He was going to teach them on earth no longer. After he said this, he was taken up. Very significant wording. That verb taken up in the Greek is in the passive voice which means Jesus was literally taken up. He didn't go up. He didn't ascend in and of himself. He didn't actively arise. It's just an important little subtle insight. He was taken up before, notice, their very eyes. 
Now, boys and girls, young people, why is it critically important for us to take note of those few words before their very eyes? Well, the reason has to do with our, our witnessing for Christ. Many people will just call the Bible a, a book of fairy tales, uh, a human book, or they will say that Jesus was a good man, a moral teacher, but he was not God. An important point for us to remember in what's called our apologetics, our defense of the faith, is that what we are reading here are eyewitness accounts of what happened concerning the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, if you would care to turn with me, let's go to the Gospel of Luke, the uh, first chapter, Luke chapter 1. And by the way, as we're turning there, just keep in mind, in Acts 1 verse 1, Luke writes, In my former book, Theophilus, the name Theophilus means you can see Theos Phileo, lover of God. It means lover of God. He calls him Theophilus in, in, in Acts, but in Luke he writes the following. Luke 1, verses 1 through 4, page 818. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first notice were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you. Notice, most excellent Theophilus. It's just a subtle insight, but he's some kind of high-ranking official. He's some kind of authority figure in the Roman uh, Empire. And Luke refers to him as most excellent Theophilus. When he gets to writing the Gospel of Luke, he just calls him Theophilus. Apparently, they had become friends or, or they had some kind of discipleship relationship because he writes it, the introduction, in a more familiar uh, manner. I, too, decided to, do, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. He said we were eyewitnesses of these things. Now, friends, similarly, if you would care to turn with me toward the end of the Bible, page 1054 in the Maroon Bible, 1 John chapter 1. Not the Gospel of John, but the first epistle of John, 1 John chapter 1, page 1054 in the Maroon Bible. Similarly, the first four verses, notice what we read. John writes, That which was from the beginning, which we, underscore that, have heard, which we, underscore that, have seen with our eyes, which we, underscore that, have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have koinonia, may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Eyewitness accounts. Now again, let's go back to our text in Acts chapter 1 and pick it up in verse 9, and we read that again. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, notice, and a cloud, underscore that, hid him from their sight. A cloud, a cloud. Skim biblical history in your mind's eye. Does the appearance of a cloud ring any biblical bells with you? And I, I, again, I see the heads nodding. First of all, let's go back to the Old Testament and let's go all the way back to the second book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, chapter 24. Exodus, chapter 24, and drop down to verses 15 through 18 with me, please. Genesis, Exodus, 24, verses 15 through 18. Here we read, When Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud, boys and girls, young people notice, covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. And Moses entered the cloud as he went up on the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Now, speaking of 40, let's go to Exodus 40. Just turn to the right with me, please, if you're in Exodus with me. Exodus chapter 40, drop down to those last few verses of the chapter of the book. Uh, Exodus 40, verses 34 through 38. Notice again. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, 
they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night, in the sight of all the Israelites during all their travels. But friends, that cloud does not just appear in the Old Testament. Can you think of a time in biblical history in the New Testament where a cloud also appeared? Any ideas? Let's go to Matthew chapter 17. It's one of the places it's recorded. First gospel account in the New Testament. Matthew 17. And drop down with me, please, in Matthew 17 to verses 1 through 5. Matthew 17, verses 1 through 5. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. They were sort of the inner circle of disciples, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Notice, while he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now, friends, when we put these and similar kinds of biblical passages together, as we, in other words, apply the analogy of faith or allow Scripture to interpret Scripture, as always we must do, it's true that we would uh, probably concede the point that Matthew Henry makes, and I'm just quoting him now. Matthew Henry says, This cloud appeared to help check the curiosity of the disciples. John Calvin puts it this way, This cloud appeared, quote, to restrain our boldness from peering into that which God had chosen not to reveal to us. But still in all, when we put all these kinds of passages together, would you not agree with me that what we are seeing here is a sort of theophany or visible representation of the power and presence and even approbation or approval of God. The, it's, it's a theophany. And, and when we put all this together with Acts chapter 1, it reminds us that the reality of the physical ascension of our Savior, His reception into heaven at the Father's right hand, and His coronation as King of kings and Lord of lords, assures us of the truth of the promises of God's Word, which relate to to the ascension of our Savior. For example, if you would care to turn with me, let's go to Hebrews chapter 4, page 1035 in the Maroon Bible, page 1035. In Hebrews chapter 4, page 1035 in the Maroon Bible, verses 14 through 16, notice what we read. The author writes, Therefore, Hebrews 4, 14, Since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And friends, not only so concerning Christ's ascension, but let's go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. In Romans chapter 8, page 972, verses 31 through 34. Romans 8, beginning in verse 31. Notice what Paul writes. He says, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is the one that condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, notice, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Now, friends, consequently, that is why back in... um, Question and answer 49 of the Heidelberg Catechism on page 880. Again, that question is asks, how does Christ's ascension to heaven benefit us? And the answer is, if you will look uh, right at the beginning of that answer, first, he is our advocate. Boys and girls, an advocate is one who pleads the cause of another, who intercedes for another. How does Christ's ascension to heaven benefit us? First, he is our advocate in heaven in the presence of the Father. 
And so, here we find that the comforting reality of the ascension is the second key lesson those disciples had to learn and that you and I need to learn if we desire to faithfully fulfill our own calling and commission concerning the church and kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, friends, let's go back to Acts chapter 1, last, one last time together, where we find a third and final key lesson which we need to learn along with those disciples concerning the ascension of our Savior. That is the lesson of Christ's return from the ascension. Christ's return from the ascension. For example, look at verse uh, 10 of Acts 1 with me, if you would. It says, They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. Why, did they, why do you think they were doing that? Why might you have been doing that very same thing? Looking intently up into the sky as he was going. Well, I wondered uh, if perhaps they thought maybe the cloud would disappear and Christ would reappear as he did on the Mount of Transfiguration. I sort of prayerfully pondered the possibility that maybe they thought heaven would open and they would see Jesus uh, ascending to the Father's right hand, perhaps. I thought maybe they thought that, that Christ, you know, they, they didn't want him to go and maybe the cloud would disappear and he would, he would descend right then and there and be with them again. We don't really know for sure why they were uh, staring up into the sky. But in the words of Matthew Henry, uh, I'm going to quote him again. He said, Christ's disciples should never stand at a gaze because they have a sure rule to go by. Think about that in relation to that, 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 that incident. incident. Matthew Henry said, Christ's disciples should never stand at a gaze because they have a sure rule to go by. And what is that rule that they and we have to go by? Well, it's exactly the rule or the statement that the angels go on to make. Look with me again at verse 10. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. Now, boys and girls, picture this. When suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. That word dressed in white is the Greek word lukos, and it means a brilliant, dazzling white. And it's the same way that the two angels were described on resurrection morning in Luke 24, verse 4, if you're taking notes, Luke 24, verse 4, when they were standing outside the tomb of Jesus. And those two and these two were obviously angelic beings who Hebrews 1.14 tells us are sent to serve those who will inherit salvation, are sent to serve those who will inherit salvation, the angels. He's, undoubtedly, these were two angels. Now think about that. You know, if you're taking notes, jot down Luke 16. We don't have to turn to it, but Luke 16, verse 22. Luke 16, 22. In Luke 16, 22, it, uh, it's a parable of Jesus. And in that verse, we read, The time came when the beggar, that is Lazarus, died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The time came when the beggar Lazarus died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. Now think about this. I've had the honor and opportunity of serving as a pastor now for uh, 40, 40 years. Over those 40 years, I have had numerous opportunities to be with people right before they died or as they died. In other words, I might have visited someone who was dying and left and they died subsequently, or I was with them when they died, numerous times. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, brothers and sisters, or if anyone ever told you this or know this, but many times before a person dies, they go like this. I see, I see heads nodding. They go like this. And it's almost as if they can see something or know something. I had one instance in Pompton Plains where the brother was fighting a long battle with cancer. It was terminal. He didn't want to die in the hospital. He wanted his wife to bring him home, and, and she did. And she was just keeping vigil by his bedside. One day, she she's sitting by his bedside in Wayne, New Jersey, and he says to her, honey, it's time. She had kept the Christian radio on and different things, and she, he said, it's time. Turn the radio off. It's time. 
close the blinds, it's time. And she said, what are you talking about? He goes, it's time. She, he just kept saying, it's time. With that, the doorbell rings. She goes to the door, and it's his brother who's coming just to check on him. How's he doing? She said, he's talking crazy. He says, it's time. They go back into the bedroom, and guess what? He was gone. He was gone. He was gone. Now, the most, what word do I use? Dramatic, uh, what, I don't know what word to use. Incident that anyone ever personally shared with me. And, and this is going to sound remarkable to you. It sounded remarkable to me, but listen to what I'm saying. I am telling you what the people who were there told me. Okay? I'm not going to say the name because of the recording, but if you want to know, after the service, it was a, a Orthodox Presbyterian pastor, an OPC pastor, and his wife told me this story. He's from New Jersey. He was from New Jersey. Very sick, terminal illness, wife keeping vigil by the side, pretty much kept the nurse in the house to help her. And her daughter comes to visit and says, Mom, you just can't sit here for hours and days on end. Let me take you out for lunch. Takes her out for lunch. The nurse says to the daughter, why don't you just leave the girls, two young girls in the backyard, and I'll, I'll keep an eye on them. So, so she did. They go out for lunch. They come back from lunch. They go in the house. And the nurse says, I am so sorry. The pastor passed while you were out. The daughter says, oh, mom, I am so sorry. Let me go outside and tell the girls. She goes out into the backyard, and it's two young girls, as I recall. They're swinging on the swings. The mother kneels down and says, honey, I'm sorry to tell you that pop, pop passed away. Pop, pop passed away. And those two little girls said, the mother tells me, they said, Mommy, we know Papa passed away. We saw the angels carry him to heaven. We saw the angels carry him to heaven. Now, when you put all of the scripture and those kind of anecdotes together, you can't help but wonder if there were, you know, legions of angels transporting, so to speak, taking up our Lord Jesus, into heaven. And that these two stayed or came to say to them, men of Galilee, verse 11, why do you stand here looking into the sky? Now, friends, I have always read that as a rebuke or a reprimand, and maybe it was. But one Reformed Bible commentator writes, the angels have been sent not to rebuke, but to reveal. They were sent not to rebuke, but to reveal, and perhaps so. But whatever the, whatever the intent of what they said, we know the content of what they said. Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, not nobody else. It's this same Jesus who has been taken and literally taken up from you into heaven, will come back. Not may come back, not might come back. He will come back in the same way the King James says, in like manner, you have seen him go into heaven. How was that? Physically, literally, bodily, historically, gloriously. The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way, in like manner, you have seen him go into heaven. And my dear, dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, is that not the very same promise which Jesus himself has given to you and to me? And my dear brothers and sisters, would you not agree that considering the state of the world in which we're living and considering the sin and the sorrow and the suffering of the world in which we are living, that you and I ought to long for that day more than we generally do on any given day. Isn't that true? In fact, if you would care to turn with me, go back to John, the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, 
John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Uh, Jesus is uh, about to go to the cross to pay the penalty for the sins of his people. His uh, disciples are, are careworn and fear-filled, anxiety-ridden. And in John 14, verses 1 through 3, Jesus says to them, and he says to you and me, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Glory be to God. And similarly, 1 Thessalonians 4, if you would care to turn with me, go to the right several pages after Acts and Romans and the Corinthians and all that. You come to 1 Thessalonians 4, page 1019 in the Maroon Bible, page 1019. 1 Thessalonians 4, pick it up in verse 13, and I'll be reading through verse 18. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, page 1019. Paul writes, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed. Some translations say I want you to be ignorant about those who sleep in death, literally who fall asleep, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. It's going to be a great reunion. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive and are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Before anything happens to any of us who are still alive, those bodies are going to come out of the grave, the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds, the rapture, to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, parakaleo, therefore comfort. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. The third and final lesson which the disciples had to learn and which you and I also need to learn concerns Christ's return from the ascension, His return from the ascension. Well, you know, friends, uh, as I mentioned last week, Margaret and I had a trip recently to Canada to see our youngest daughter, Bethany, and actually, after we visited with her, I started doing some reminiscing about her growing up. She was eight years younger than the next child. You know, so she was kind of an only child in a sense, be, be apart from the other six. And uh, I got to thinking about a time uh, 24 years ago. Bethany was three years old, 1999. And a dearly loved friend, a uh, woman, a uh, widow from Pompton Plains, uh, treated me and Margaret to a several-day trip to the Netherlands at the request of her husband who had died. He had been battling cancer. He, he worked on elevators in New York City. He got asbestos in his lungs, and uh, he died from that. A very brutal uh, battle for about a year. And before he died, she told me he had said to her, I want you to take Pastor and Margaret to Holland. That's where they were from uh, after I pass. So she did. Well, we're getting ready for the trip, and, and due to her mother's heart, Margaret really didn't want to leave Bethany behind. <laughs> She's three years old. We were going to be gone for, you know, about, I think, 10 days or so. And uh, Margaret was worried about that. So I was reminiscing that, and honey, I, I don't know if you remember this or not, but virtually every day before we left, and sometimes a few times during the days before we left, uh, Margaret would take Bethany into the uh, living room of our parsonage and she would play for her a video. Uh, boys and girls, I don't know if you know what a video is anymore. I'm such a dinosaur, but it was a video um, of a children's song. And it was a group of children singing a song that went partly like this. My mommy comes back. She always comes back. She always comes back to get me. And she wanted Bethany to have that in her heart and mind when we left. Well, friends, those words aren't only true for a faithful mother. Those words are also and especially true from our faithful Savior. And that is why in Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 18, question 49, the question asks, how does Christ's ascension to heaven benefit us? And it says, secondly, we have our own flesh in heaven as a sure pledge that Christ our head will also take us, his members, up to himself. That is, 
in heaven. Or in the words of Jesus in Revelation 22, 20, yes, I am coming soon. And amen, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's bow our heads and our hearts together in prayer. At that time, said Jesus, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And He will send His angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather His elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. And Heavenly Father, until that great and glorious day when our Lord Jesus will sit on His majestic throne and separate the sheep from the goats, it's judgment day. If any one of us here today is not ready for that day, be, our, be we younger or older, male, female, married or single alike, oh Father, could we be ready for that day? Because by Your sovereign grace and electing love alone, today is the day when they repent of their sins and profess faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And so, O oh faithful Father, until that day, may each and every one of us and ours be found faithful by Your grace and for Your glory in the fulfillment of our own calling and commission concerning the coming of Your eternal kingdom and the building of Your church. Having listened to and learned from, having heard and by your grace heeded these three key lessons concerning the ascension of our Savior. Hear us, Heavenly Father, we pray in His most high and holy name. Amen. Amen. Amen.